Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is Friday. We have had a blockbuster morning, clubhouse, training. Now we'll do a little bit of an IG Live on top of the IG Lives, on top of the webinars, on top of StreamYard, on top of everything else that we do. Good morning, good morning, good morning to the West Coast that may not have caught us. You can catch uh, on Spotify all the trainings, iTunes, The Playbook. Download The Playbook uh, and we're there. Uh, for all of those on my team, uh, please, I will ask for the sixth time. Let's post. There we go. Thank you, Matt. I don't know where my team was this morning, but David at dmelzer.com is where you should be. If you want anything, just reach out to me. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is Friday. We should have our guest, Tendai here, the beast himself, Matawariara. Uh, my friend, professional rugby player for the Old Glory DC, which is the MLR, the Major League Rugby. I've been involved in rugby for a long time, and uh, some of the best rugby players uh, I was blessed to not only be friends with, but play football with. So the Craig Hartleys and the Dave Hodges and the Dan Lyles of the world, amazing American rugby players, uh, unstoppable scrummage men, the beast uh, is he here? I need to know. All right. Where are you, my friend? I do not see. Let's take a quick question as we wait for Tendai. Uh, we will take the questions in here. From your perspective, what does better being better mean? Oh, that's easy. Being better means to enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of your potential. Not what other people think, not what you're missing, not what you don't want, but your potential, your truth. In quantumly, according to different activities, you have different potential. Some things you have a higher potential than others, uh, but nonetheless, pursuing that potential is quite important. Uh, very good. Um, and uh, then our hour, that's not it. All right. Tendai is not here, I guess. My team... Help me out. Joseph Storzinger, good to see you there, my friend. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. All right, let's get this uh, going. Um, what is your most valuable lesson learned this week? Uh, in where to put my energy. Uh, you know, I have been ignoring the 80% of the profit in my life, 80% of those that feed me. I've been spending too much time with the 20%, with the 80, I've been spending 80% of my time with the 20% that bleed me. And uh, I got to start firing it from my life. So personally and professionally. And so I just want to get really focused in on the fact that the people that feed you usually don't need any maintenance. And we want to lean into those people, not lean into the people with closed mind, closed hearts and closed hands. Uh, so uh, we'll be working on that. Kuda, good to see you. Yeah, we're on a tight time frame here. Uh, all righty, Tendai is joining now. Good to see you, my signables friends. We're going to be tomorrow doing a great signing uh, with Tendai and uh, professional rugby player going and getting what we need to do. Thank you, Kuda. All right, let's see here. Uh, keep the questions coming. It's been a lot going this week here, today. How do I build my credit? Uh, email me, david at dmelzer.com. Uh, there's some great sources of how to build credit, understanding how it works. I know Cole Hatter, my friend, is one of the experts of understanding when to pay, how to pay, what accounts to open, what's not to open, where to keep uh, you know, your limits at uh, all types of ways to just build your credit, how to um, dispute uh, and check your credit. There's so many free services today. Reach out to me, david at dmelter.com. I'm happy to help anyone uh, with that and refer you out to people who help with that as well. Janine, sometimes I feel like you've figured all these things out and don't make mistakes. <laughs> Not me. My only thing that I have figured out is I don't know what I don't know. And there's billions of variables of what I don't know because as I mentioned earlier today in my training, there's billions of galaxies and uh, in the context of those galaxies there's billions of data points within billions of galaxies and to think at any level i could be at a perfect order or to know everything would be completely uh, obtuse and not within the alignment of how big in the scopes and scale 
of what we're doing. Uh, very good. Let's uh, see here. Thoughts on the Lakers landing Russell Westbrook? Uh, well, I'm more concerned about Scherzer because I keep hearing the Dodgers or the Padres, and I hope it's the Padres. Uh, but I think it's a great pickup. You know, the UCLA stud, unbelievable uh, eyes and vision, team player, defensively strong. I think it'll make all the difference in the world uh, as LeBron plays the last few years of his career with Michael... Uh, uh, sorry, with Russell Westbrook would be incredible. So I think kudos to the Lakers. I'm a Laker fan, and now just leaning in even more. Can't wait for next season. Sorry, Milwaukee. Sorry, Phoenix. Here come the Lakers. All right, awesome. Keep the questions coming. Best professional sports coach of all time, either Coach K or Belichick, uh, both <laughs> consistently uh, win at the highest level. And uh, so I, those are my favorite coaches of all time. <coughs> of course, the pyramid man behind me, John Wooden. Uh, I just too young to really understand. But the fact that John Wooden's pyramid sits in the cafeteria at Stanford uh, probably should show uh, show a lot uh, to be there. Um, all righty. Let me join here. We missed the beast. Uh, so we will join. Oh, it looks like uh, Michelle needs to upgrade her IG. Oh, nope, she's there. And now Tendai joined. So, hey, Hi. how are you? Good, how are you? I am terrific. Thank you for joining me. My pleasure. Happy summer, everybody. <laughs> Happy summer. Founder and CEO of Lively, wearelively.com. Uh, look, you are building an incredible uh, company. And uh, you have taken it from a concept to over $105 million, which is no easy feat. Uh, what has been the biggest challenge for you as far as time uh, in building your business? Uh, I know that so many entrepreneurs have a misguided expectation in time. And I love speaking to people like you that are starting to realize results but can articulate the time challenge of the expectation of time, et cetera, as you've been building your business. Yeah, I mean, the word time is an interesting thing. It's actually what I call our greatest asset. You know, people think money is the most important, but it's actually time because you cannot buy time, right? And so in terms of building a business, I grew up watching businesses take decade, decade and a half to really hit success, right? And so I took that with me, which is building a strong business is all about discipline, focus, and patience. And so for me, time was about holding growth levers, knowing statistically more than half of the companies that start implode in five years and 90% implode in 10 years. I'm just trying to make it to five. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we hit our five year last year, but I would say time is one of those things that can be on your side or against you. If you pull all your levers at once, you don't have anything to pull later on in time. If you hold levers, you can leverage time to be an asset. I love it. The other challenge that you face is one that I faced as well, which is the pressure of the opinions of others, especially relatives of our own. You know, I grew up with a mom. Education was literally it. It was the fetus wasn't fully developed till after graduate school. It was doctor, lawyer, failure. And I know as you with two immigrant uh, parents who probably were multi-focused on your stability of success, not your entrepreneurial success, yes. that we had to kind of break out of some sort of resentment, guilt, or offense from the people who love us most. And, you know, for me, it was one of the greatest challenges as an entrepreneur to break outside of what other people's expectations of me for my own good, which sure. make, you know, it's one thing for people who hate me to have expectations of me. I really don't care, but, but it's, the person who's working two jobs 16 hours a day to provide opportunity to you, it makes it very challenging to make decisions that are not congruent with their expectations for you. How did you do that as, you know, a female minority immigrant, child of immigrants? I mean, I could oh, imagine right. the expectations that have fallen on those tiny shoulders. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because up until the age of 25, I thought all of those things were expected of me and it was just the way that you lived your life i didn't grow up with the word entrepreneur that was not part of the vocabulary in my house it was go to school get good grades go to college get a job that you stay in for four decades and live a happy life and that would be doctor lawyer investment banker 
So I did all of those things. And then I went to law school for two weeks. And I realized I'm like, this is not what makes me happy. That stint I did in fashion was where I was happy. And I called my dad. And I said, I'm gonna quit law school. And I was terrified, you know, I'm gonna quit law school. And he's like, is that what's gonna make you happy? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, great. And I'm in that moment, I was like, so I lived a life of assumptions. I assumed this is what they wanted from me. We never talked about it. I assumed that's what success meant. And once I started to live life on my own terms, I realized success is your own definition. It's really happiness and fulfillment. And when you find that fulfillment, that's when you start to kick ass at life. <laughs> yeah, and it's so interesting because I think there's a middle ground too that I lived in where you know, there is an expressed desire for you to be a doctor, lawyer, investment banker, or failure. But beyond that, you discounted the fact that, you know, and I've learned at a later age, and I articulated every day to my mom, knowing what a parent really wants for you, which is no matter what they say, do, or believe, all a parent wants is for you to be happy, even more importantly, healthy. Uh, they want you to appreciate them, meaning you have to acknowledge that they add value to your life. Uh, and then, of course, love them. And if you do those four things, whether you're a fashion guru, a doctor, lawyer, investment banker, or even a failure, uh, you know, it doesn't matter to your parents if you're healthy, happy, love and appreciate them. Um, and I want to reiterate that because I think it's one of the greatest releases in order to create an abundant life of yourself to follow the consistent, persistent pursuit of your own potential. Uh, last thing real quick, you know, you have leveraged experience. Uh, into this company of success. And I say that, that a lot of people attach their emotions to outcomes and, you know, working with different companies as you've developed your own career. In that development comes the importance of knowing self. And within the context of an entrepreneur, self to me includes what are my skills? What is my knowledge of who and what? And then finally, how do I maintain that desire that I must be what I can be? The thing that got me to where I'm at, but will take me even to the next level of abundance, of limitlessness and infinity. How have you been able to look within and continue to develop, regardless of what happens outside of you, all the pressures, discrimination, separation, anxiety, worries, fears that everyone faces, how have you been able to focus in on your skills, your knowledge of what and who, and your desire? Yeah, so I, you know, I studied finance and I know cash is king and I understand a P&L from top to bottom. And I understand the inner workings of how a business needs to run to become profitable and how to then take that, simplify it and explain it to others. Because building a business is just not about selling a product. It's actually building confidence around the people that are working for the business, investing in the business, believing in the business. And if you cannot articulate that heart and soul of what that is, people can't rally, right? And so I would say I took my knowledge of how to build a business financially, the P&L structure, and I can motivate and create vision and vastness for people. And so I think that's like really my skill set. Where I'm vulnerable is the inner workings of each channel. And that I acknowledged very quickly on and created lists of people that I knew could help me. So realizing there's no I in team was probably the greatest thing I did early on. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, reaching this uh, stage of acquisition, you know, we take companies, I always say there's points in my career as a CEO where I took a company to 30 million and then there's a whole different skill set to take it to 100, whole different to 300, a whole different to a billion. And they happen faster and faster, which is really weird. It takes forever to get to 30 million and then fast to 100 and then 300 comes like overnight and a billion is like, whoa, well, we're not always qualified. And I found that out as I was 29 and a CEO of a major corporation and a public one, unfortunately, as well with Sarbanes-Oxley coming out and being a lawyer myself, I even knew what that meant. Um, for you, what were the milestones that created the biggest uh, challenges where you had to reach out and you know take some humble pie and say, hey, look, I know we're really successful, but I need help. I need some people around me that have been here before and can give me directions on how to get there. Yeah, I would say year one of launching Lively, you know, the, the company was growing ridiculously fast, knock on wood. I was actually pregnant with my second child and raising capital and, you know, shipping thousands of products late. So I had to really start to build a network and hire. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs 
are stunted in the beginning about the idea of help getting help, whether that is hiring people or bringing other people on as advisors and giving up equity and so forth. But knowledge and support is power to create that momentum forward, right? I would say the second part would be, you know, when the company was offered an acquisition, I was not ready to sell the company. And I really had to look at myself in the mirror and say, you know what, there is probably one obstacle to come in Lively's journey, and it's me. Because uh, to your point, you know, we got to a certain level of growth. And that next phase, when I really looked around me, I didn't have the level of support to go into wholesale and international and all of the expertise needed to do that. But this acquiring company did. And so now we're at a place where I need Lively more than Lively needs me. <laughs> Which is a beautiful place and a lesson in humility. You can go to wearelively.com. Check out my friend Michelle at the underscore Michelle Grant. You're an incredible entrepreneur. I always love people like you because I have three daughters and uh, I always talk about you got to find your milestones to for, for my daughters because I'm not a woman and I don't know all the issues. So, you know, whether it be you or Cindy Eckert or Kim Perel or, you know, Carrick, all these different beautiful uh, entrepreneurs uh, have helped my daughters as milestones because if we can't see where we want to go, we'll never go past it. And I appreciate you allowing uh, the future generations, especially of women and immigrants, uh, to see the possibilities, probabilities uh, of what we can do in America. Not a perfect country, but still, to me, the best country to take nothing and have everything. And thank you for showing us that journey. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful day. We're lively.com. Michelle Grant, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Incredible entrepreneur. Uh, facing her challenges and going far. All right, we're trying to get uh, Tendai's in here now. Let me quickly grab uh, Paula Ferris, uh, broadcast journalist and author. Let me, I think she's ready to go. And uh, yeah, and we'll grab that. Uh, I'm loving this. <laughs> All right, Paula, there we go. Hi. Hi, David, how are you? I'm amazing, how are you? I'm great. I'm doing really well. I enjoyed the tail end of that conversation with Michelle because I'm getting ready to launch a company, which is a little terrifying and something that I never thought I'd do. So hearing, you know, the the trials and challenges that she's gone through as an entrepreneur, um, it was really, really good to hear. Well, it sounds like you are no stranger uh, to being comfortable, being uncomfortable. You launched your first book here in July, uh, you know, 20th, so a week ago or so, mm -hmm. uh, called Called Out. Why I traded two dream jobs for a life of true calling. And I can appreciate that. And I wanted to start because this idea of a calling sometimes takes on too much of a religious context that it does to me an energetic one. Right, uh, right. Know, this pull of the universe that tells us that we have a greater purpose, a greater potential uh, to me is a calling. And when we can elevate our awareness uh, of that calling, uh, for said, then we can expand and grow and learn from it. Uh, so how did this calling occur? And how does your book intertwine with your calling? Right? Well, we just released the paperback edition of the book of called out the hard copy was released last year. But I wrote it because David at the height of my career where I was anchoring Good Morning America, and co hosting the view, I, I lost sight of who I was, you know, that that adage, what good is it for a man to gain the world, but to lose his soul in the process. And I thought, well, this is the one thing that I was called to do that I was created to do. And yet, I'm up here and I look at look around me and assess the landscape and my relationships are failing. I wasn't spending much time with my husband and my kids, my health was failing. And so those values that I had professed were so important, were just really clashing with the choices that I was making. And once I decided to pump the brakes at the height of my career back in 2018, and then I just left ABC News last year, I just really found out like I, I had to figure out who I was outside of the job right? To figure out who I was outside of the doing. And I know you say that calling can take on religious connotations. And I totally agree. I grew up in faith circles and they would throw that word around. I'm like, what does calling even mean? Like, is it my job? Is it, a, is it a career? Is it just this one thing? And so I really just, I feel like we have two callings. We have a faith calling or a purpose, and that's why we're here. And then we have vocational calling and um, vocational calling will change throughout our life. And I think we're, but we pigeonhole ourselves and we back ourselves in a corner. We're like, I have to do this one thing. I have to find one thing I'm good at. And guess what, David, if we attach too much of our identity 
uh, to that one thing. And when that thing changes, like it did for me, you're not going to know who you are outside of it. So I'm just on a mission to give people permission to try new things in new seasons. You don't have to do one thing for the rest of your life. And that is not that thing that you do. The things that you do are not your value. They're not your worth. They're not um, the sum of who you are. Um, you know, find out who you want to be, not just what you want to do. Yeah, I've created these uh, five daily practices that, it, you know, through my own journey, I've experienced that. I most frustrating thing, I ran a company called Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment. They made the movie mm -hmm. Jerry Maguire about our firm. Yeah. And being a white middle-aged male running the most notable sports agency in the world, you can imagine, as you have experienced, how many people will come up to you and say, oh, my gosh, I dream yeah. about having your job. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're like, I'm effing miserable. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, you know, I always and, said dreams. I would say dreams can be nightmares too. So like yeah. you, you, you reach this summit and you look around, you're like, this is not how I expected it to be. Yeah. Which then I created these practices that eventually changed my why to applying my why to mm -hmm. what I do, to seeking the love, the light and the lessons and having a system to prioritize uh, by my own personal experiential giving and receiving value so that eventually I came to a point where my health, for example, is first. I have a non-negotiable of a minimum of an hour a day on me. And That's then good. it goes to my family. And then it goes to activity I get paid for in time, uh, which I talk about all the time because people don't intertwine time. But I've learned to, number one, prioritize by my what, my who, my how, That's and good. then apply my why to that and so many people I don't think understand applying their why that the you have a choice to find there's love in everything love in everyone mm -hmm. and you have a choice do I want to spend the time do I want to prioritize seeking and finding the light the love and the lessons in this person in this situation in this vocation and when we can determine and prioritize those all of a sudden there's expansive fulfillment, passion, and purpose, and even profitability in what you do. And in, through your yep. career, from Good Morning America to The View, to all the ABC stuff, you know, you actually have now learned by reaching that pinnacle that, gosh, maybe I should have applied the why to what I was doing while I was doing it, mm -hmm. or I can't find the priority within the context of what I was doing, so now I'm gonna apply it somewhere else. Do you look back and see, wow, I could have made those remarkable experiences more remarkable by applying a why or seeking a different purpose in it or was it just not congruent and not worth the time and priority to spend in those big ventures i don't think that it's endemic to the industry that i worked in i think it was a problem that i had where work became my narcotic of choice it was truly my drug it's where i got a hit you know the accomplishment the accolade seeing the awards on your shelf that's what it became to me that's what became, that's the fuel, um, that's what fueled me. And I just think my priorities were really skewed because, you know, here I am, David, positioning myself as a woman of faith who loves her husband and loves her kids. And yet um, I was like throwing everything into this career and I lost sight of that. And so for me, I look, not everybody needs to disrupt it and blow it up like I did or pump the brakes. Sometimes we need to reroute or to reset some, you know, for me, I needed to reset. Sometimes you need to root in. Um, but I, I asked myself that question, you know, are my values clashing with my choices professionally and personally? And they were, and I knew for me that the, the solution to that was to pump the brakes. And in pumping the brakes, I realized, I don't know who I am outside of it. And then it set me on a journey to find, find that, that out. So I know going through a pandemic, um, going through another career shift. It's not going to rock me so much because I know who I am. And I know that sounds trite. I know who you are. But no, finding the parts of you that don't shift and shake in a crisis, in a pandemic, um, you know, I, I'm now rooting into that. I'm a curious question asker who likes to champion and challenge people that that was, you know, I positioned myself in the broadcasting world with that. But I'm taking that into a new I mentioned entrepreneurial space. I don't know the first thing about business and, and the entrepreneurial space, but I'm taking the unique gifts and talents that I have, we each have unique gifts and talents. And I think we can, once we tap into those unique gifts and talents and really uncover them, it gives us permission to, to try new things and to take risks and to branch out. Again, we don't have to do one thing for the rest of our lives. So I say, what are you good at? What do you love? And what do trusted people notice you're good at and you love? You have to be good at it and you have to love it. So you can be good at things and you don't love it. You're not being called into that lane. 
I'm good at asking questions and being curious and I love it. And my nickname was Paula 20 questions that I champion people and I challenge. So just embracing that, the who I was uniquely created to be, who you uniquely are created to be, um, it gives me permission to just to, to exercise those gifts and talents on different vocational branches throughout my life. And I hold it loosely. I, this doesn't define me. You know, this new company that it doesn't define me. The podcast that I launched doesn't define me. The book, this doesn't define me this stuff can all shift and I have to be careful not to place my significance in something that shifts. And, and I've found myself doing that way too often and losing sight of who I really was. Well, it's a, a perfect journey you're on now and a perfect perspective. I will tell you after 35 years of being an entrepreneur, the one piece of advice I keep telling myself in the two words on my nightstand are radical humility to remind myself to ask for help that find right. people that fit in the situation that I want to be in and ask them for directions. I'm always amazed with the athletes that I help and celebrities and entertainers. They've had coaches their entire career, but for some reason, when they get into the entrepreneurial side or business, they think that they, you know, they've needed it in football for since they were five years old, but they won't <laughs> need it with their money. And they wonder why they're not getting to where they want to be as quickly. So, uh, so I, I definitely that. last question real quick, because I know you're launching the paperback is, you know, you have done this far longer and far better than I, my notes, uh, no, I haven't. my notes no. were incorrect. No, my I notes haven't. Were, no, my I notes were incorrect because it says it's her first book. And I was like, shit, it is. No, I'm wrong David, again. <laughs> David, it is my first book, but it's just the launch of the paperback. Yeah, so you were right. Detail. You were right. Don't worry about it. It's all oh, right. I don't worry. Where is the wasted emotion? <laughs> I but agree I, with you. I love teasing. I agree my, with you. I yeah. tease my team because we do like so many of these. But one of the things that I found in my first book is they made me do the audio book. Mm -hmm. And then they made me release the paperback. Each time I had to do a different type of release of the book, my book disappointed me more and more because I'd grown past my book, my strategies, philosophies. Um, I was hoping with the launch of the paperback, you could share one lesson that you learned from relaunching the book as a paperback, something in the book that you're like, meh, I'm past that now. I wish this mm -hmm. would change to explain to people. Uh, so when they read it, they'll say, oh, she's even grown more than this. This is a yeah. lesson that's not in the book. Yeah, I, one big lesson that's not in the book. So I, the paperback, what I did was I, I heard from a lot of people that read the hardcover that they wanted a companion guide because it's kind of memoir, but it's also teaching a little bit, you know, struggle. Um, so in the paperback, there's a six week discussion guide and it's included in that. And I'm going to host a book club in September. And look, I'm writing this out of struggle not strength, David, I am walking it. I don't know what the next chapter looks like, but I will say one thing that I don't, I, I do talk about fear quite a bit in the book, but one thing that, that I have really embraced in this new season, blowing up our lives, we moved from New York City to a small town in South Carolina during the pandemic, um, you know, leaving ABC, you know, starting new ventures, but making sure that it fits into me being a mother. You know, it's like instead, you know, before my career had to fit into to every, or, I, you know, everybody had to fit into my career, I should say. And now I'm like, here, I'm holding my kids. I want to really be present as a mom. And so all these freelance projects or what have you, I'm like, does it fit into me being a mom first? But the thing that I really, I really want to expound upon even in the next book, and I, if I could encourage people is, you know, you can have a piece in your spirit that you're supposed to do something and you can still be scared as hell about it. And I think those getting used to those two emotions coexisting at the same time, they're not mutually exclusive. We had a peace in our spirit that we were supposed to stay in South Carolina, but we were still scared as hell about what was on the other side of it. And something that's really helped me in this new season that's not really covered in the book is asking myself, what's the best thing that can happen if I go for it? What is the best thing that can happen if I go for this company? Because so long, for so long, my fears would have prevented me from going for it. Oh, you know, I, I'm not a business person. I'm not an entrepreneur. I don't know the first thing about that. I, all I've ever done is broadcasting. But I ask myself, what's the best thing that can happen if I go for this? Um, and taking myself to a positive space instead of asking, what's the worst thing? The worst thing, I would fail. And then, you know, I'm, I have such a fear of failure, I wouldn't go for it. So I think just um, rejiggering, knowing that you can be scared, but have a peace about what you're supposed to do reconciling those emotions that it's normal to be scared about something, even though you have a piece in your spirit and your gut that you're supposed to go for it. And then to help give you the courage to take that next step, keep asking yourself and meditate on it. What's the best thing that can happen if I go for this? I love it. Just remember when you blow things up, those explosions propel us somewhere. 
And so it's not, <laughs> it's not punishment and destruction, mistakes, failures, and setbacks. It's propelling. So when we re-engineer those things that seem as if we're blowing it up or exploding totally. them, it causes a propulsion. Uh, and you're just propelling to something better, a better situation and a bigger yep. opportunity. And I'm I excited. Love, love the mindset and anything I can do to help you. We have other shows Thank to you. promote the book as well, your podcast, whatever I can do. Thank let you. Me know. I'd love to swap with you sometime and keep on exploring be great. the open-minded, open-hearted and open-handedness and the value system that you've learned to create from the extraordinary experience of being such a great uh, journalist and celebrity uh, and media star. So oh. thank you so much for joining me. Have a wonderful weekend there. Thank Southie. you, David. Enjoy your you, family. You too. Congrats. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. Have a good awesome. weekend. Okay. Check yeah. out Paula Ferris if you haven't already. She's amazing. Uh, called out why I traded two dream jobs for a life of a true calling, what that calling is, and how to follow your calling. Uh, what a great discussion. Go back and listen to this. Uh, if you want those five daily practices, David at dmeltzer.com. Uh, please, everyone, reach out. I am here to be of service. Uh, my books as well uh, available to you, ebook, audiobook. I'll send you a book, sign it, and uh, pay for it. Not a problem. All right, let me see if uh, the beast is available. I'm trying to find out. Give me an indication, uh, everyone. Oh, Rob Deerdick's in the house. Good to see you. Uh, ridiculousness, my man, the master of being a student of his calendar with qualitative and quantitative analysis. That man knows productivity, accessibility, and gratitude like nobody else I've ever met. Uh, Tendai, hopefully you're here. Uh, IG is not perfect and neither is technology as Jake found. Oh, there he is. See, everything works out. That's the way I go. All right, we have you know, the Beckham of rugby. The Gretzky of rugby. There he is, my friend, the beast. What's going on? Hey, I'm all good, man, David. Nice to meet you. And uh, sorry about the technical difficulties we're having early on, man. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. And, you know, I have watched you play for years. I uh, played college football with David Hodges. Dan Lyle's a good friend. You know, I've worked with USA Rugby with the Sevens. I love watching it into the Olympics. Lee Steinberg and I helped put rugby uh, into the Olympics as well in a variety of different ways. And we need in America people like you that truly understand how the game is played uh, and bringing more attention and awareness and education to rugby, uh, which believe it or not is a much bigger sport worldwide than Americans understand. You know, it passes us by. Uh, so for, for you, how hard was it for you to come to play in America? Uh, and, you know, what was that transition like compared to, you know, playing uh, uh, over, over in South Africa? No, thank you. For, you know, for me, it was, uh, you know, um, so exciting, you know, and I did it right at the end of my career. And uh, I'd always been attracted to, you know, um, uh, USA Rugby, and uh, you know, I always wanted to come and, and grow the game because I believe that there's so much uh, potential. You know, there's a lot of talent uh, in America, and uh, you know, the only thing is that rugby needs to be put on the map, and there needs to be more uh, people that advocate the game in the, in the U.S. So I wanted to be, you know, at the center of that, and that's why I embarked on this journey. So I signed for a team in uh, Washington D.C. last year. Uh, I went to go play for All Glory, and it was an amazing. Um, uh, you know, time for me, uh, but unfortunately, my time was cut short because of the pandemic. You know, so I was only there for about uh, two and a half months, and I played a couple of games. And already, there was a lot of you know um, uh, attention on the game. And I was, you know, um, doing a lot of uh, marketing uh, because I was a marquee player in the league and uh, trying to grow the game. You know, so my love for USA rugby is quite huge, and I hope to kind of continue that, you know, long into the future. So hopefully I'll be back there soon. Well, you will be, and you're so important to the game, just like Beckham and Gretzky were uh, to those games. One of the things that uh, shows a sport is much more a sport than a skill uh, is the ability to take, you know, the greatest athletes and put them into a football field in Europe on a pitch or in rugby, 
you know, just because you are fast and strong doesn't make you a great rugby player. Uh, and the transition what we tried to in America, you know, bring our greatest college football players, American football players onto the rugby pitch and thought there'd be a translation of how easily we could beat South Africa or New Zealand or other places that have the subtleties of success of the game. Now, I know you're nicknamed the beast uh, because of your power and unstoppable line breaks that you have, but, you know, there is a subtlety to the game. You know, there's a, a deeper understanding of the game. Yeah. What are some of the nuances so we can educate people in America, you know, that we may not see that, you know, Gretzky talked about skating to the open space or, you know, obviously Beckham showed as he came over here and launched the MLS after all the years brought the attention of how, how to play that game. What are the subtleties that you've learned that are just more than the raw, the raw power and talent that you have, that the real subtle nuances of the game that make you great? No, I think, you know, the first thing is that, you know, um, you know rugby is a, is a team sport. So you have to, you know, realize, you know, if you want to be, be a great rugby player, you have to be a team player, you know, you have to work with others around you. And you've got a specific purpose on the field and you have to do your job, you know, for the team to function and be successful. So those are, you know, that's a great lesson to learn. And, uh, and I think, um, you know, in terms of, you know, actually like taking it even further, you know, I think working on your skill set, because I think, you know, when you look at rugby, you know, you have to enhance your skill set, um, you know, quite a lot, you know, every single season and improve uh, and not just, uh, you know, become... Um, um, you know, uh, ignorant to, you know, the changes around you because the game is ever changing, the laws are ever changing. So you have to move with that and keep on working hard. And I think, you know, there's so many similarities with American football and rugby, but I, I just find rugby to be more of a, you know, of a team sport. And there's so many more team uh, dynamics uh, that, you know, you can, you can learn and embrace. So I think those are probably some of the, you know, the significant things that you can learn from the game that will make you great. Yeah, one of the things that I love about rugby uh, that I find remarkable out of all sports I've ever watched or participated in, on the pitch, the fiercest competition that can even be seen as almost hateful. And the minute the game is over, both teams who have been fighting to sometimes what seems like the death can have a pint and enjoy and sing songs and hug each other. It, it's the, the epitome of competition to me that you can leave the separation in the competition on the pitch and immediately, immediately, you know, everyone's on the same team when it's over uh, and enjoying each other's company and the competition and the stories and the pain and the cuts and the bruises uh, together as one team. So it is the ultimate team sport because I think it's the only sport where everybody after the game is on the same team and it doesn't carry over. It's beautiful. One of the other things that we're doing together uh, in tomorrow, we, we're working with signables. And, you know, there's obviously collectibles have been a, a big part of sports, the legacy of sports, the, uh, you know, to me, the irrationality of sports that somebody would pay thousands and millions of dollars uh, for, you know, a rugby ball with your signature on it. But now we've taken it to the next level with signables and not only have the physical aspect of having your favorite player and your favorite sport, but also the digital aspect and then a monetization and NFTs and all types of opportunities further. What are you doing with signables tomorrow? Yeah, so, um, yeah, I'm quite excited for the partnership, you know, with signables. Uh, so tomorrow we've got a live free event uh, at uh, three o'clock South African time. Um, and, um, you know, it's all about engaging with the fans. You know, I think I've always been passionate about, you know, connecting with my fans, people that have followed me, you know, my entire career and our avid fans of rugby. So tomorrow is an interaction uh, and, you know, just kind of sharing my story, going down memory lane and speaking about some of the highlights of my career. Uh, yeah, and then just uh, kind of answering all the questions that, you know, the audience might have and signing memorabilia, uh, you know, which is super exciting. And uh, also having some one-on-one -on -one, uh, time with the fans. So it's pretty exciting. And yeah, please join if, you know, if you can.
Yeah, I think I'll have some one-on-one -on -one time with you as well at 6.30 a.m. Pacific time. I'm hoping to get myself a signable, a collectible, uh, add to my uh, rugby collection, which is mostly USA rugby uh, because I've been around it for so long, sevens and 15s, of course. I can't wait to join you tomorrow. Where, where can people find us tomorrow for the signable event? Uh, yeah, so there is um, uh, there's obviously a link uh, yep. that was shared. Uh, it's actually on my, my Instagram page. So, you know, they can just jump onto that and then sign up. And then, uh, yeah, then they'll be a part of the event tomorrow. Awesome. And I'll put the link up as well. People, join us tomorrow. The incredible beast himself, Tendai. Thank you so much for joining me. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. And keep up the great work. The Beckham, he is the Gretzky of rugby. You wait 10 years from now in America when everybody's playing and watching rugby. I'm going to come back to you and just say thank you. You did it. Awesome. No, thank you so much, David. I appreciate your time, man. And all the all right, have a good night. Take care. Your team, man. Ciao. Awesome. Thank you for your patience. We got them on. Technology is victorious, as you'll find with signables. We'll put the link up there. Email me if you want to join us tomorrow, 6.30 a.m. Pacific time. I'll be there. 6 a.m., I think it starts. Uh, ask questions. Interact with the beast. Uh, of course, get your signables as well. It's a signathon.live forward slash beast. Signathon.live forward slash beast. I posted it up there. Thank you so, so much. I'm going to take another question. Uh, it's been a heck of a morning. I'm blessed to be with all of you. If you want any information, book, ebook, audiobook, want me to sign a book, send it to you and ship it. David at dmeltzer.com. Who's the best or what's the best way to evaluate your business growth over the past couple of years? Well, you know, for me, it's understanding what your own milestones are. Uh, the problem with growth and acceleration and compound interest of the positive nature in business is that the aggregate behavior is hard to recognize. It takes about 90% of the time that you're going to spend to be successful just to get to 25% of the growth. And so the subtleties of growth are hard to distinguish. So what I prefer to do daily is to take inventory of that growth by knowing how am I consistent? How am I persistent in the pursuit of the milestones personally, professionally, giving and receiving wise? So if I focus and detach my emotions from an outcome daily by saying, did I do my best? What did I learn? And am I happy? Am I having fun? I know that I will accelerate towards an angle towards what I want with faith. I'm going to end up somewhere better. If I create timelines and attach my emotion to the timeline and the outcome, I'm actually creating resistance that will slow me down. And so I teach people to have that perspective, to enjoy the consistent, persistent pursuit of their potential by having a desire that they must be what they can be, by utilizing five daily practices every day. Know your what, your who, your how. You're now in applying your why, as I talked with Paula about. You can have those five daily practices, david at dmelzer.com. Don't miss out. Use them every day. You will get to where you want to be faster. You will be radically humble and gracious. You'll live with gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration. Amazing day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. Remember, most importantly, everyone, be kind to your future self and do good deeds. I will see you tomorrow morning with the sign-a-thon, and then the CLS experience, the paradigm shift with Craig Siegel. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Thank you.